After Killers, and back when both The Asylum and David Michael Latch were just starting out with no idea what to do, I guess Latt decided he was a thriller director. So, after making one thriller, he went directly to direct another thriller. What resulted from that decision? Wildflower. No, not the Daryl Hannah Eric Roberts movie released the exact same year, both of whom incidentally did later feature in Asylum movies. This movie... exists? Look, I'll level with you, I got nothing. This is probably the most obscure Asylum movie we've looked at yet, if not of their entire catalog. As far as I can tell, nobody on YouTube knows this movie exists, as I just get clips and reviews of the other movie. Okay, it has an IMDb page, a couple reviews, but no production notes, no notable names, and the pictures are so blurry, Puddle of Mud are ready to sing about them. Heck, you know what's on the DVD? The movie! Yeah, not even a trailer! The clips you're seeing now I had to take from the movie itself, so thanks for the additional editing work. But okay, popularity doesn't equal quality, I'm sure a lot of hidden gems exist with little to no attention or advertising. Heck, that's one of the reasons why I started this look at the assignment to begin with. Is this movie one of those gems? No. Yeah, I'm just gonna come right out and say it, there's nothing remarkable about this movie in the slightest. That doesn't mean it's necessarily awful, it's just... there. Heck, I wish it was awful. Awful gives me something to work with. I'll save what I do have to say for later. Right now, let's start the plot. When a billionaire and head of a very powerful corporation dies, his three adult children, Ethan, Dennis, and Audrey, and their spouses and lovers, all come scrambling to his lawyer to claim their inheritance. For reasons I don't think are ever given, they're all forced to live together in a cabin up in the mountain with no cell service until arrangements are made for each to receive their money and shares, and to elect the new head of the company. Along the way, they rescue a woman who is being beaten up in a car, and take her with them just because Dennis finds her hot. At the cabin, things begin to heat up, in more ways than one, as the siblings start to plot and scheme about how they'll backstab one another and take everything for themselves, while also having a lot of bisexual intercourse. And as the icing on the cake, the woman they picked up, named Nicole, has her own ulterior motives, and may know more about these arrangements than any of the actual beneficiaries. Can the siblings survive long enough to claim their money and identify the mysterious killer stalking them? And if they don't, can the audience muster a care? If Alien Abduction was a Twilight Zone script stretched beyond its breaking point, this movie is an overlong Days of Our Lives episode. Or the Young and the Restless episode, I don't know, just some super dramatic soap opera featuring rich young people you're not supposed to like, with a lot of plot twists yet nothing is actually happening. I wish I had more ways to say that something is standard, because I hate how many times I've used that word throughout this retrospective. And I have to use it again here. Nothing stands out about this movie. It's not an interesting story, there's no funny or provocative lines, no impressively shot scenes, not even a sense of dread or buildup, which even killers managed to create. And if it sounds like I'm bringing out the general summaries too early, that just goes to show you how little this movie gives me to talk about. Now overused stories and settings aren't necessarily bad, I didn't have much to say about Death Valley Bloody Bill's Revenge, but that was because it was a general monster movie, where even though we've seen all these characters and situations hundreds of times, they're still fun to watch, and the cast and crew still gave it the energy it deserved. This movie is empty. Empty of feeling, empty of creativity, empty of anything worth pointing out, but I'm gonna try anyway and see how much blood it can wring from this stone. So an important factor in a thriller, where characters are supposed to carry the movie, is to have, well, some standout characters. We should get an opportunity to learn about them, find out why they're here, what their relationship with everybody is, what they like, and if we want to see them survive. And since this is also a murder mystery, we should get a little backstory and motivation for each of them, so when the killer is revealed, the pieces can click into place and we can root for the characters we want to survive and see the ones we don't get axed even if the killer is the only one we want to see come out on top. And all of that is nowhere to be found here. These are some of the most cardboard cutout, one-dimensional characters I've ever seen. They're here because they're in every other thriller movie, so they're in this one solely to fill out the checklist. 
We have the older son who feels like he's the only one worthy of any responsibility and that he's entitled to the family business and fortune. We have the irresponsible horny son who's deep in debt from gambling and buying his spoiled girlfriend gifts. We have a scheming daughter who mostly keeps to the shadows and just goes with the flow, baring her teeth just often enough to show she's not being pushed around against her will. And we have the mysterious stranger who's up to something, but what she's doing and why is completely unknown. And that's it. What are supposed to be character templates meant to be expanded on are placed in this movie completely unironically, just so this so-called thriller can have characters seen in a thriller. These aren't characters, they're Unity assets bought wholesale so a hack programmer can cobble together something for Steam in an afternoon and say, I made a game! I'm on equal footing with Hideo Kojima! Take me seriously! With the added disappointment that Jim Sterling won't be showing them their place. And if that's not bad enough, what basic character traits and roles in the plot they are given make them so loathable you don't care what happens to any of them. Oh, one of them is threatening to do everything in her power to dethrone her brother as the successor to the family business? Well, that guy is an abusive husband who's holding the other brother's money hostage until he turns over his stocks in the company. And that brother is an equally abusive alcoholic who owes six figures to the mob and who forced his girlfriend and the woman they picked up into a threesome. And that woman is secretly planning something fiendish that will probably eliminate them all so she can get a big payout from all of this. They're all horrible, horrible people, with no other intentions other than to be horrible. So why should we care if any of them make it out? The only characters that aren't horrible sacks of crap are Ethan's wife Jackie, who all throughout the movie tries to gather the courage to tell him she's pregnant, and Dennis's girlfriend Zoe, who's just there to have sex and be the movie's airhead. So they're still just miserable, ineffective props solely placed to be miserable and ineffective. And I probably made them sound more interesting than they actually are. The siblings treat each other with contempt, sure, having passive-aggressive conversations, hurling insults at one another, and eventually threatening one another and forcing deals out of each other, but it's all done because it was in the script. At no point did I ever feel like altercations happened because the characters had enough personality or depth to naturally start these arguments. They had to happen because they were written to happen. The characters are given one note, one role throughout the entire movie with no change and nothing affected by the effects of the movie. This one guy goes off to get drunk because he's unhappy? Well, he's been drunk and unhappy the entire movie, so no change there. This woman is sneaking around, making suspicious gestures and expressions? Well, she's been doing that since they arrived, so why should I be shocked she's doing that now? It's all cause, no effect. Actions don't trigger reactions. There's nothing set up at some point that pays off later. It's just things happening because they have to happen for this movie to be a movie. It's a slasher movie they forgot to put a slasher in, and Lord knows I wouldn't mind Jason Voorhees murdering everybody on screen. There's no depth, no intrigue, no effort given. Their props placed solely to act out the plot, and for a thriller where character involvement is key, we now have no reason to care about anything that happens. Especially since, for a movie so reliant on its script to move its characters like chess pieces through the plot, there's virtually no plot! In fact, let's quickly break down what happens. The characters are told that their father's dead. They gather in an office to be given instructions to get their trust funds. Dennis has a badly edited and underwhelming car chase with the people he owes money to. They get some gas and pick up the abused woman. They make it to the cabin, and then the plot just slams on the brakes for a good hour, not picking up again until maybe the last 20 minutes. And from the moment they get to the cabin to the end of the movie, most scenes are comprised as such. Two characters walk on screen, they deliver exposition, they walk back off. Two more characters walk on screen, they deliver exposition, they walk back off. Lather, rinse, repeat. Sometimes we'll get a threesome, but a good chunk of the film is solely comprised of two people walking in front of the camera, robotically talking, then walking back off again. Or, if we're lucky, we'll just have one person muttering exposition to another about stuff they should already know and the audience doesn't care about. Because why should we care? You didn't give us any reason. It's not as if I'm walking in off the street, Ethan. It is a family business. And that gives you the right to walk in and take it over? I have just as much right as you do. After all, we do both have the same last name. This is amazing. It's as bare bones as scene setup can get. This isn't even first day film school filmmaking. I'd call it middle school drama club level, but even that sounds too nice. 
This is the kind of writing and directing that you'd see in a parody of bad writing and directing. Only here, they expect to be taken seriously. They expect us to enjoy this Twitter-length stock story, to support these truly unlikable characters, and to enjoy this completely unfocused plot. Oh wait, did I say unfocused? I'm sorry, I take that back. Despite the movie's clear lack of story, plot, or character motivation, it does have a focus. There is something that gets a lot of screen time, and the one thing that brings the characters together. Sex. Lots and lots of sex. This is the most explicitly sexual movie of this retrospective so far, and we're still a long way from the Asylum's actual softcore skin flicks. But while something like King of the Ants made its sexuality a theme, and Vampires vs. Zombies is blatantly a porno just with a softcore version, there is no reason why this movie is obsessed with sex and nudity. It doesn't add to character, it doesn't form a theme of the movie, and it comes right out of nowhere. It could have been cut out and nothing would be lost. Oh, except for a good chunk of the runtime. It's a 90 minute movie and at least a third of that is comprised of nothing but characters screwing. It starts with two solid minutes of the character's father banging a prostitute. After an uncomfortable scene with Jackie, we get to see her husband doing it rough with his secretary. And then most of their time at the cabin is dedicated strictly to nudity, makeouts, and more unsexy sex, with a couple girl-on-girl -girl moments and a menage a trois thrown in for good measure. Which begs the question, why didn't they just make this a porn? It's obvious that the plot was meant to take a backseat to the sex, and every time a sex scene happens, the already paper-thin plot comes to a complete halt as we're forced to watch these characters bang. And yet, while there's an uncomfortable amount of sex, it's all softcore and vanilla, so any chance to turn its audience on is minimal. No penetration, no foreplay, not even any shots of gentalia. The most we get are breast and sometimes butt shots, which the movie overcompensates with, so even that quickly loses its appeal. I haven't seen this much nippleage up close since I was three months old. But even that would be fine if it was filmed provocatively. If they let the camera create a steamy atmosphere and used transitions and clever imagery to capture the beauty, the horror, and the hedonism of the act. Something like Eyes Wide Shut did. But they don't. At best, we get soft fades while the camera remains perfectly still. And because we don't actually get to see them bang and we don't care about these people, any eroticism these scenes could have generated is instantly lost. I don't feel turned on. I feel dirty, desperate for the scene to be over just so we're that much closer to the end of the movie. I'm a straight man, and my good friend Willy the Worm remained completely limp through every single one of these scenes. Congratulations, movie. You've left me pining for the creativity, plot progression, and character relationships of vampires vs. zombies. Hell, the sex scenes from the room were more erotic. In fact, come to think of it, yeah, that's what this movie is. The wooden acting, the one-note unlikable characters, the repetitive scenes, the two people walking on screen just to deliver exposition, the awkward emphasis on unsexy sex, the non-threatening tone of what should have been a dark story. This is the room, just with all the hilarity cut out of it. This is what Tommy Wiseau would have made if he was native to this planet. All the sub-amateur directing, all the unnatural lines and line reads, and all the nudity, with none of the charm, quotable alien dialogue, or naive misunderstandings of the world around him. I need that money. If I don't pay these people, I'm f***ed. Now who do you owe it to? A bookie. <laughs> what a story, Mark. Also, a complete and utter lack of spoons. That's the biggest crime committed here. The acting is very soap opera. I think most of these characters were given one sole direction for the movie, to look as grumpy as possible while reacting to everyone like they spilled their $5 coffee on their laptop. It's like their acting coach was a sister from Troll 2. Or me. Everything is so overdramatic and overemphasized, I'd be laughing if I cared about a single thing they said. And the volume for their line delivery has two settings, angry nothing shouting or exposition dump whispering. Don't talk like that. I just don't. doesn't mean I have to bow down to Ethan. Thomas is a prick who is now in charge of a multi-billion dollar company. You want my money? You want my stocks? You take, 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 and take! My absolute favorite acting moment, though, has to come from Ethan. Most of the movie, he's just this stone-faced, humorless, abusive stick in the mud who just swats everyone and everything away like they were a mosquito crawling on his arm. 
But then towards the end, when things start getting real and he actually has to show an emotion, he suddenly starts morphing into Matt Dillon doing his best James Franco impression. So what was this, huh? Some overhanded attempt to show me that you're moving into my territory? There's no f***ing way that you're taking over Hobbs Enterprises. He'll be over my dead body. I'm not talking about her. I'M TALKING ABOUT ME! Why did you just piss on my car? Oh my guy, can we have this guy as the next Green Goblin, please? Out of the movie's cast, there's only one familiar face. Technically two, but we'll get to that. Kim Little's back is the sister Audrey, and she's so much more talented than the rest of the cast, it's painful. She's the only actor who seems to have any concept of emotion, and who bothers to give different reactions to her situations. Her character is the only one that comes anywhere close to having quirks, or even an arc, changing from somebody seemingly detached from the action and wanting nothing to do with anyone or anything, to becoming somebody completely different by the end. Okay, it comes right out of nowhere during an insane twist-filled ending, but trust me when I say it's one of the most entertaining Kim Little moments I've seen so far. Admittedly, it may just be in comparison to the rest of the performances, which are so dead inside you'd swear they just watched a Tom Green marathon, but it's an effort to do more with the character than she's likely given. I'll take it. The rest of the cast is comprised of... people. Most did a few projects, then found something better to do with their lives, but a couple did make it somewhere in the industry. Chris Hoffman, who played Dennis, seems to be the only one still active, at least as of 2017, and recently completed a long run on the show Backstage. Dean Stapleton, no, Dean, Dean Stapleton, who played Ethan, has only been in two movies since Wildflower, both of which he produced himself, and hopefully both are a better indicator of his talents than his portrayal here. Tammy Sheffield, who plays Zoe, was a bit of a screen queen up until 2014, and cameoed in the later Asylum movie Scarecrow Slayer, which was also directed by David Michael Latt and featured Kim Little, and is a slightly better movie. But the other name of note in these credits, besides Kim Little, is C.C. Costigan, who plays Nicole. I've never heard of her before this movie, and she hasn't been in anything since 2003, but apparently she's an adult film star with a bit of a cult following, and in recent reviews of this movie, she's the one often given special mention. Though most of her notoriety may be from her brief marriage to Brian Heideck, winner of Survivor Thailand, and that they're both apparently horrible people in real life. I can't confirm or deny that, but if her performance in this movie is any indication, I think I'd be better off not looking into it. The technicals are mostly fine. The lighting and camera are well used, kept still in most scenes with the occasional sweeping movements and a good sense of mise and scene in regards to the actors. The editing, for the most part, is okay, though the standard built-in scenes transitions can get a little distracting. And the sound features the exact same goof as Sorority House Party. Yes, two David Michael Lapp movies made seven years apart feature the exact same audio glitch, where an actor will begin talking in one scene, then it comes to them in another scene saying it again, effectively stepping over their own line. Do you want something? Do you want something no, different? No, stop twisting things around. I can't really do that. I could sort of understand this hiccup in 1992, where they still had to manually splice physical film and audio tracks together. But considering this is 1999, where editing switched over to digital, how do you even make that kind of mistake? They couldn't just mute the audio file at the end of those scenes? Admittedly, it doesn't happen nearly as often as that movie, but my point is, there's no reason it should have happened at all. Even I, with the baby's knowledge of Audacity and Sony Vegas, know, know how, how to trim, trim my audio, audio so, so this doesn't, doesn't happen. happen. The only thing I can say is done confidently is the music, which seems to be a theme for this retrospective. There are three songs in this movie, one for the opening, one for a sex scene, and one for the credits. All are good, but the theme for the movie stands out the most, because of how out of place it sounds. It's done in the style of a James Bond movie, complete with slow transitions and abstract images behind the opening credits, like it was made for a completely different movie. No joke, after having to watch two old people screw for two minutes straight, when this came on, I was hyped. I wanted to see what the theme was promising. 
If they put that much effort into a song usually reserved for action-based, sultry espionage and heist movies, this was sure to deliver on everything the song promised. Well, I was horribly wrong there, but the song's still great. Maybe I'll use it for my own spy movie one day. Besides the theme song, the only other redeeming quality of this movie is its twist-filled ending. Because it's ridiculous! Like Vampires vs. Zombies or Scarecrow, it's just twist stacked upon twist, scene after scenes happening just for the sake of ridiculous, over-the-top, non-sequitur scenes happening. Unlike those movies, it's not actively trolling us, and they actually put some work into this to make it work as an ending, so I sadly can't spoil anything. But trust me when I say it comes right the hell out of nowhere, and it stays. No build-up, no subtle clues, nothing preceding the twist to give any indication how this movie will end. Heck, I don't even think they knew how it should end. There's a scene where things seem to wrap up, everything fades to black, and then it continues on, going so far as to retcon a few things established earlier in the movie. It's like they had an ending, somebody high up didn't like it, so they had to film a completely different ending before they could release it. There's also the resolution of a plot element introduced near the beginning of the movie that revealed the dad seemed to know who the killer was, which affected the absolutely nothing, but thanks for tying up that loose end, I guess. Oh, and there's a subplot about lesbians. It's there. It's just thing after thing, revelation after revelation, twists that belong in a parody of a thriller that they expect us to take with sincerity, right down to the ultimate hero-villain exchange cliché. You won't get away with this. I already have. Top it off with the crazy Kim Little performance, and we have one of the most unintentionally funny endings from an Asylum production. It, it, it almost makes sitting through the first 70 minutes worth it. If the rest of this movie was this cluelessly goofy, this would have had no problem getting my recommendation. But it's not. This is a shallow, hollow husk of a movie. For most of its runtime, nothing happens, and what does happen, we have no reason to care about. I don't care about these characters, I don't care about the sex scenes, I don't care about who gets the inheritance, and I don't care if anyone survives, or even if they die. The performances are so underwhelming and the characters are so unlikable, they're just not worth watching, period. There's no dread, no intrigue, no arc, no competent directing, not even a single line I could say was spoken like the actor didn't just read it off a cue card. Even with the out of place theme song and that insane ending, it's just not worth sitting through sheer nothing to get to those points. If this was a story arc on one of those daytime soap operas with established characters and a more realized setting, it might have been salvageable. Or even if they went all the way and made it the porno it's trying to be, I could at least understand its purpose. But as a thriller, it is a boring, infuriating, amateur mess of a flick. I'm tempted to put it up there with some of the worst Asylum productions we've seen so far, but even that feels like I'm just giving it too much credit. Like it actually did something to justify such an honor. Just leave it in the obscurity it deserves and find a film that's worth giving a darn about. Like the Daryl Hannah Wildflowers movie. I haven't seen it, but after watching this, anything would be more worth your time. Speaking of which, what's next on the list? Well, bring it on. Whatever happens, it can't be any worse than what I just watched. Right? Hey there everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider supporting me on Patreon and help me create even more content like this. It's only a dollar to get early access to my videos, and only five dollars gets you a credit at the end of each of those videos, with higher tiers offering these and even more perks. And as you help me reach certain goals, I have super special content lined up for all of you. Head on over and check out my Patreon today, and I'll see you next time.